Welcome to this video lecture on response surface methodology. When we have identified a number of variables that affect some important response in our process, we might want to explore that relationship in some detail. This could give us a good understanding of the process and might also allow us to identify optimum settings for the factors that will give rise to the best response. It could be something where largest is best, like strength or lifetime, or it could be something like smallest is best, like cost or environmental impact. But we want to find out what are the best settings of the input variables that will produce the best outcome. And we can do this using contour plots. Contour plots represent higher and lower levels of the response based on the settings of the input variables. And in the um, plots that follow, we will look at the impact of a number of different variables on the distance traveled by a paper airplane. In particular, we will look at the angle at which the airplane is thrown and the grade of paper from which it's made. And we'll use this to illustrate the ideas of response surface methodology. Now, when we draw a contour plot, we can only display two variables at a time. Uh, in the same way that on a map, you have north and east, and you can see the contour plot. So a contour plot looks like a map. We typically use deeper shades of green for higher mountains or higher values of the response variable, and then shades of blue and deeper shades of blue for lower and lower values of the response variable. So by looking at a map like this, we have the two uh, factors, angle and grade, represented by where we normally put east and north on a map. And so we get the impression that the terrain is higher as we come down towards the bottom of the map. That is with a lower grade of paper, we get larger distances. We also see that as we move from left to right across the map, we also get darker shades of green. So that tells us that longer distances are provided by larger angles. Of course, the angles being explored here are just between 20 and 30 degrees. And likewise, the grade of paper are limited to uh, grades of paper between 80 and 90 grams per square meter. So looking at this contour plot, we see a number of things. Uh, and, and these will be listed on the next slide, but I'll leave this slide here so you can see it visually as we talk through it. Number one, greater distances can be achieved here with lighter paper and with larger angles from among the grades of paper and the angle sizes that we have explored. Secondly, we notice the contours are roughly parallel. And this indicates that the response surface is a plane, a plane surface, as opposed to something like a ridge, which we'll look at later, or a trough, which is similar in profile to a ridge, except it goes down rather than up, or a peak, which we'll also look at later, uh, or a valley, or a saddle. So here we have a plane shown by the parallel contours. The third thing we notice here is that the optimal settings for the factors are probably outside the range of levels that we have explored. Because if we went further to the right, that is larger angles still, and lower grade paper still, we might get even greater distances. The fourth thing we could say is that as we go towards the optimum response, if we go further in the direction of the optimum response, the shape of the response surface might change. There might be some curvature that arises. And so there might be a ridge or a peak uh, as we'll see later, rather than it just continuing to be a plane. And the fifth point to make is that we might not be able to follow the path to the peak because there may be other considerations. For example, a very low grade of paper might give a good distance for the paper airplane, but might give a very short lifetime. So there could be some other issues that arise. Or a very low grade of paper might not be possible because the current paper manufacturing process might be unable to deliver it. So these points are made on this slide here that we've just talked through on the previous slide. Here we show a ridge. You can see from the uh, contour plot that the optimum angle seems to be 45 degrees. And when you go below 45 or above 45, the uh, 
response. The distance travelled by the paper airplane rises to a peak at 45 and then falls again. And that seems to happen for every grade of paper. And here in this contour plot, we have a peak. So there's an optimum grade of paper, which looks like 75 grams per square metre, and an optimum angle, which is 45. And a departure in any direction takes you down off the, the summit, takes you away from the peak in the response. Now, uh, for process optimization, we could have a target which is largest is best, something like uh, product lifetime, or smallest is best, something like cost. Or we could have target is best, where there's a dimension or some other measurement which needs to be at a certain value, neither higher nor lower. If we have a target is best, then it's best to choose a point on the contour plot where the contours are widely spaced. Because in a place where the contours are widely spaced, if there's a little bit of error in the input variables, it means there won't be much difference in the response. It's a bit like wanting to land your parachute at a certain altitude. Well, it's better to land it where the terrain is fairly flat or horizontal, rather than on a steep mountainside, where a small change in your, your easting or northing could give rise to a very large change in the elevation at which you will land. Now, in order to pursue the peak, in order to pursue the optimization of the process, we can either use offline experiments, which are faster and more efficient, or we can use evolutionary operation. Evolutionary operation means we allow the process to continue its normal task of producing product for sale, but we make small tweaks to the process to discover where the optimum um, values for the process inputs might lie. So it's, it's cheaper in the sense that the product is saleable. It's not a specially designed experiment, but it, it is uh, time consuming and requires a lot of data. So if we're using evolutionary operation, an approach we can use is called the path of steepest ascent. So the steps we take in this is wherever the process is currently uh, set up, we find this path of steepest ascent by conducting an experiment where the process is currently located. So we, we carry out a, a two-level design, a two-level experiment design with center points at, at the current process setting. So if we have current uh, grade of paper and current uh, angle, we make small changes and explore in the current region in which direction does it appear that the response, the distance in this case, would increase. And when we identify that direction of change, it might be uh, in the direction of um, increasing the grade of paper or reducing it or increasing or reducing uh, the angle or some combination of those when we identify the direction we move in that direction as far as is helpful uh, until the response begins to deteriorate it's a bit like if you want to find the top of a mountain and you're on a mountainside in the dark you might just stand there and just put your foot one step forward one step backwards one step to the right one step to the left and try and figure out where does the terrain slope upwards from here? And when you've identified that direction, walk in that direction and continue walking as long as the terrain continues to move upwards. But as soon as it stops going upwards, then stop. And that becomes the new base for your next experiment where you begin to do that process all over again. So then you start a new path of steep descent. And this can be a useful way to gradually nudge the process towards an optimum level. Um, uh, desirable properties for all these designs is that they're orthogonally blocked and rotatable. These are mathematical properties that give rise to good outcomes in terms of the estimates that are made. Now, a second way of um, identifying a response surface is a central composite design. If you already have a fractional factorial design, you can you will have corner points and center points. A central composite design just adds axial points, which are like points on the face of the cube in the multidimensional design space, or they actually protrude from the face of the cube. Um, 
And so this can augment an existing design to provide a response surface design. However, the best design of all is the box Benkin design. It's, it's economic, it requires a, only a small number of observations to deliver a good result. So if you're planning a response surface methodology from scratch, the most efficient design is a box Benkin design. Uh, there are no points outside the cube, so you have no worries about violating process specifications, and no points at the corners of the cube, so not, you won't have a situation where all inputs are set at extreme values simultaneously. But the best thing about a box banking design is that for a small number of observations, you can gain a lot of insights on the response surface. So here's a response uh, surface uh, represented by a contour plot based on the temperature and time of a welding process. Uh, there was another third variable, but it wasn't significant, so it's been omitted from the plot. It's always worth drawing the contour plot with the two variables, which uh, seem to be having the greatest impact on the response. And any other variables can be held at settings that are either uh, middle or high or low. So here we see with these two variables, the time and temperature, this is the temperature of a hot bar and the time for which it is applied in a welding process. We see there's a peak close to temperature of 85 degrees and a time of about 2.2 seconds. So we can uh, identify uh, an optimum by carrying out a, res a response surface experiment. In some cases, we have multiple responses that we wish to optimize. So we may have, let's say for a paper airplane, we might want to maximize the distance traveled, but minimize the cost and also maximize the lifetime. So we may have these multiple responses that are of interest to us. And we can, Optimize the composite desirability by taking all of these responses into account. And we need, to, in order to do that, we need to quantify the following criteria. First of all is the importance. So we can place greater or lesser importance on the different outcomes, on the different responses. What's more important to us? Greater distance or longer lifetime or lower cost. We also, for each um, res response, we can specify the goal. Is the goal that the smaller is better or larger is better, or our target is best. Uh, so we can specify that. And if we have a smaller is better, we can specify something unrealistic, like zero for cost. And the, the, the uh, analysis will get as close as possible to zero. So it can be something that's unrealistically small, or it can be something that's so small that any further reduction is irrelevant. And the third thing we do is the weight. We identify the weight. And the purpose of the weight is to emphasize or de-emphasize the target as compared to the bounds. What's more important to get on target or just to avoid the, the bounds, the tolerances for that particular response. Uh, and here is a contour plot for, um, again, a welding process where we've got temperature and time with multiple responses as represented by the red, green and blue lines. Now the white region on the graph shows a region where all uh, of the three responses are at satisfactory levels. So at least they are within the specified bounds. And so we can choose any setting. Uh, for example, the 85 and 2.5 takes into that white region. And it's, it's a satisfactory cost and lifetime and strength. And of course, we can move around inside that region in order to obtain uh, somewhat different outcomes. But everything that's in the white region satisfies the specified specifications for all of these responses. You can read more about this in the textbook in section 7F.